Welcome to The Reboot Show. I'm Sally A. Ellingworth, your host, and I'm excited because today I'm here with Amy Smith and Luke Stowe to have a conversation about what the future of university looks like. Now, I'm very excited to be having this conversation, Luke and Amy, because I think it's very topical, uh, and I think it's a challenging conversation because the university industry, if you like, and the university business model um, is very much uh, a legacy situation. So I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, are universities still relevant? What a, what a great heavy-weighted question to start with. <laughs> are you look, ready for it? Yeah, look, I think, I think they are. I think they are still relevant, um, but it's in a different way. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we all can see that uh, there's been a shift from bricks and mortar universities and lecture theatres uh, now to online capability. And I think that'll be a continuing trend. Uh, one that, you know, I think will be embraced. Uh, but there'll still be a mixture of bricks and mortar as well as uh, online. It'll just be a, a different mechanism and different experience for people to engage with universities moving forward. That's what mm. I think anyway, Amy. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure. Like, I'm, I think they're really struggling for relevance. Like, mm. I, I think it's been one of those traditional, you know, education sectors that's been ripe for disruption for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And I just, I really don't think they're keeping up at the speed that we need from an educational point of view. And then really the purpose of putting people through university is to make sure that they're really skilled for the workplace. And I don't really see that that is happening the way it needs to be right now. So would you say that there's sort of the challenge of making sure that the content being uh, taught, if you like, and delivered at universities needs to be relevant, but then also the means and the way it's delivered needs to be relevant as well. Like they're mm. two separate issues. Or would you say that the content being delivered is sort of in a good condition and that's fine? It's just maybe digital delivery that needs to happen at a greater scale. Oh, no, I, th I think it's definitely changed. Mm. Um, so, you know, content writers, I think, are one of the, um, you know, most important roles within universities now because now we're talking about how do you take that, you know, um, lecture that was given by an academic uh, and how do you make that a bit more informative and a bit more entertaining so yeah. it can be and up online to date. Up and up to date. date and engaging. I mean, yeah. you two know the, the power of that. And I think this is exactly where businesses, um, you know, want to play too with universities mm. is if you think about this from a learning point of view, not just from a student, um, you know, we talked about right skilling uh, a couple of weeks ago on one of the shows. And I think this is really quite an important factor within universities moving to online because you're no longer just catering for students, you're catering for learners, mm. global learners. Yeah. And um, the rise of micro-credentials is really quite important in this. So, What is know, that? Well, micro-credentials is where I might have a degree mm. that I'm doing through a university, but then uh, I can choose to do an extra credit, which is a digital credential mm. that I can earn, study for online and earn, and it can be delivered to me, and I can display it on my LinkedIn profile or any of the yeah. profiles that I'm using uh, within social media or my resume to show that I've got that additional skill. Mm. For example, nurses doing a, a nursing course uh, at Stanford University can also then do a blockchain uh, micro-credential, which will take them an extra like 10, 20 hours to do, mm because they know the universities engage with industry and they know yeah. that the next wave of nurses coming out of that university, they want to have some blockchain capability because that's what the hospital demands. So with those micro-credentials being uh, delivered online and the, the student engaging through some sort of digital solution, would you say that that's sort of good enough or no, that the core um, degrees, if you like, also need to move to an online space? And if so, how do you guys foresee that being managed? For example, in cases where to get a degree, there is a lot of practicalities to it. You need to be in, for example, a science lab. How is that possible? How is that going to be managed if we are moving towards digital and that's the future? Amy? I'm going to take this one, Luke, go. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Stay within your circle of competence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I often go out, don't I? I think, you know, there's the, there's the student experience element to this as well that people mm. are, are missing because I think for a lot of students, if I, you know, students go to university a lot of the time because their parents tell them that's the right thing to yeah. do and you have that sort of traditional uh, conditioning, if you like, to say, well, the only way to get a good job is to go to uni to get that piece of paper yeah. and then you walk out of uni into some six-figure job and your life is set up right and we know that's not the case. Well, that was secure. That was meant to be secure but, you know, job security, there is no such thing these yeah. days, right? People need to own their careers and, and move forward but that's another issue. Um, <laughs> 
But I think when it comes to universities, you know, we're getting, we need to get through that mindset of it's the only way um, because it's not. We have options yeah. now. And so I think from a university point of view, they do need to look at that micro learning as a solution, exactly what mm. Luke said, to remain relevant because without that, you know, people are going in and they're learning a degree for three or four years and then by the time they get into industry, what they've learnt might not be as relevant anymore because it's based on, you know, academics and studies and theory that was, you know, from, you know, so then way back yonder. Agility. So <laughs> yeah. what, what are some things that leadership, um, and, and to your point, Luke, you mentioned um, sort of collaborating with industry because it is um, a collaborative exercise, right? Like you've got private, public, industry, and they all need to work together to ensure that they can keep that content up to date, relevant, um, and that it's sort of real world case scenarios, if you yeah. like, in terms of what you're learning in yeah. that academic environment. Um, but what are some of the things that leadership in that space, whether it's in public, private or industry, need to start thinking about to ensure that they have that student experience front of mind, uh, they know what the students want and what the students are willing to do. Uh, where do they even start with that for, I suppose, a, a space in the economy that is so traditional um, and it's had, always had such a heavy weighting mm -hmm. on an economy, like mm -hmm. it's education. I think there's some great examples. Uh, a few years back, I was lucky enough to go and um, visit uh, Infosys, which is an Indian um, um, solution integration firm mm. out, of, uh, out of India. Um, I went and visited their leadership uh, lab, which is in, um, I think, in Mysore from memory in India. And one of the things that they were talking about was how they work with uh, the universities mm. before they start employing yeah. um, to, to say, you know, we're, we're in need of, you know, 10,000 .NET software developers mm -hmm. in the next uh, two years. So they actually um, have arrangements where the curriculum that the university is teaching is actually in line with the employment that they're going to offer mm. to the students. So I think we'll see industry starting to play those type of roles globally with universities. And I think yeah. universities need to accept that yeah. because that's how they'll start to get the pipeline for, for mm -hmm. work. And mm -hmm. universities need to really be start to think a lot more around making the people that they uh, teach more employable. Mm -hmm. It's what's the point if uh, we're yeah. doing all this education, if you but we come don't, out, get, you've got a degree, don't get a job. It's yeah. worthless. So this is yeah. this yep. is part of the issue. So and uh, you're mind you, for example, in Australia, like going through tertiary education, uh, that you know has certain debt implications for the country as well. So if you're building up that that debt for the country, mm -hmm. uh, but then it's for no good reason yeah. other than we're just abiding by a legacy issue. And, and in the US, you know, we don't have, they don't have the luxury of the hex debt and things that we have here in Australia. Like you have a loan and you're paying interest on that loan and that's a college debt that you come out with as well. So you actually have to really make the, the decision around, you know, that piece of paper and it might yeah. not, you know, be the right move for you or it might be as well. Yeah. Like they do have their place, but they just do need to keep up. I know when I was at uni, I was continually frustrated with the lack of like practicality that there was in that transition from learning what you do in the classroom and in a lecture theatre to then organisations. So it's great, you know, to Luke's point yeah. that there are organisations and industries um, and universities out there that are starting to bridge that gap and work together because um, honestly, it's, it's really needed. Yeah, I remember even being in high school, to be honest with you, and I was in a business studies class involved with businesses at the time um, that weren't performing so well. And I realised even at that time that there was a disconnect between yeah. what was being taught in high school yeah. um, and what was actually happening, like economic realities. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to your point, Amy, uh, I know you've done a lot of work and you still do um, around sort of millennial leadership development and so forth. Yeah. Uh, how do you, what do you think the perception is of say the average millennial who I know you've quoted before, they're going to represent probably the largest portion of the workforce in the coming years. How is, uh, how, what's the millennials perception of universities like mm. at the moment mm. um, and probably particularly off the back of the COVID experience which really threatened those traditional ways of learning? Well I think as I mentioned it's quite conditioned you know in us uh, millennials to go to uni because you know for a lot of people it's seen as like the highest level of education that you can get which it is and it's great and there's you know but you've got to think about it like what is your objective and what is your purpose because yeah. there's a lot of millennials that are more in the entrepreneurial space and they're you know really looking for sort of those short skills and adaptability and things and a three or four or five year degree might not suit them you know so I think it comes down to the individual level it's not a one-size-fits-all thing and I think sometimes we have the mentality that it is 
So I think from an individual standpoint, um, people need to really decide on you know what's going to benefit them um, yeah. for the long term as well. Yeah, look, I, I think there is also like there's a risk here, right? Mm -hmm. So I still see universities. Us, yeah, I will if you if you let me, Sally. Um, <laughs> the um, research and innovation aspects of university, I think, mm -hmm. is still quite key. So, you know, we, we have a wonderful system, I think, globally, where universities are encouraged around innovation and research, mm -hmm. and they are, you know, cornerstones of being able to challenge the status quo, the yeah. thinking, being able to provide that educated view about what the world looks like mm -hmm. going forward. And I think that should still stay. Mm -hmm. We should hang on to that. I think they have to be much more um, experience ready and digital uh, ready, mm -hmm. enabled in terms of capability, not yeah. just for students, but for learners as well. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, I think the rise of the uneducated educator is a concern. Mm -hmm. I think people uh, are can now seeing opportunities. Can you explain that a little bit more yeah. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the audience? What does that, yeah, well, what does that what mean? Well, what I think that means... Probably means us. <laughs> well, no, no, what I think that means though is there are, univer there, there are learning um, organisations that are coming out and providing online content. Mm where there really isn't any substanti yep. substantiation as to the experience or yep. the qualifications of the people teaching mm -hmm. around the topics they're teaching mm -hmm. for. And I think that uh, is a concern mm -hmm. uh, because we've got all these people running around who are now educating others about yep. topics that um, they don't really have the qualifications mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm then what does that mean for the yeah. ongoing Well, look at the e-learning ecosystems where yeah. you have these businesses, um, whether it's a Udemy or an mm -hmm. equivalent, mm -hmm. where anyone can go on and yeah. build out their own uh, courses yeah. and so forth. So they don't have the same sort of credibility as something issued by a university, yeah. uh, but anyone can become a, an officially recognised in the yeah. online world uh, educator. I think it's the type of career and the type of practice that you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. like, I do not want a surgeon to operate on me that hasn't, you know, gone through medical school. Like yeah. that's just a given, yeah. right? So there are always going to be those traditional careers and career paths that it is mandatory for and for good reason. Um, but I think it's sort of looking outside the boundaries of, of that and maybe thinking a little bit differently about, you know, what that means. I'd love to hear what our subscribers and listeners think, yeah. uh, our, our viewers think around this topic, because I think there'll be a range of different answers mm -hmm. about traditional university. Yeah. How does that cater for digital capabilities and provide that to learners and students? And mm -hmm. what are mm -hmm. other capabilities that people are thinking about and how is that being offered? Yeah, so I, who, I has the, who has the biggest responsibility here in I this think, situation? I think the individual. Great question. I yeah. think the individual. In any scenario, whether you're in the education system, you're in industry, you're in the private sector. Yeah, look, I think the centre of control here is once again, the, the student and the learner, the mm -hmm. customer. And I think what we're seeing, and the, and the industry, mm -hmm. and I think what we're seeing is a shift from the university having that power to now understanding that the customer is at the centre. They have very much product focused organisations. So what, what can traditional education systems and organisations, if you like, do? So you mentioned the uneducated educator. And if the student is uh, choosing those sorts of options to educate themselves, yeah. What can traditional education systems learn about that process to then maybe pivot their own businesses and mm -hmm. innovate internally based on the fact that learners are going to uneducated educators yeah. to seek that information for whatever reason? I think the shift to micro-credentials is a really good demonstration of yeah. the innovation coming out of the university sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just starting to happen. But, you know, being able to get a digital qualification that may only take me a few hours to do and I can pay for using a credit card, but it is a university accredited course mm -hmm. and it will stick to my LinkedIn profile or stick it on my digital resume or whatever it might be yeah. um, that is backed and endorsed by the university as a lifelong qualification. I think that's a great demonstration of university starting to realise that if we don't start getting into this game and we don't start offering like these micro-credentials, then we'll lose out. And to that point, Amy, what would you say, How? what's the perception of the employer with all of this change? Mm. Well, it's an interesting one because, you know, university degrees used to be the thing that would really differentiate you as a candidate. So, you know, from an employer point of, point of view, you know, you see a university degree and sometimes it didn't even matter what that degree was, whether yeah. it's relevant to the job or not. 
it still carried you know, quite a bit of weight. Um, and that will depend on the organisation and that will depend on the individual as well. But what we're seeing is there's a lot of organisations out there, like PwC for instance, that now don't actually have a university degree as a mandatory requirement yeah, wow. for a lot of their graduates and people to go for those graduate positions. So I think there's actually a bit of a, um, a lapse there in terms of they're a little bit more relaxed around those strict mm -hmm. rules. Um, and so given that, it means that there's less barriers to entry for people um, to go for those graduate roles, even if they haven't been to uni. Yeah. It raises an interesting question though. Mm. Then why, why have university degrees now if, if it's, be, like, is it becoming irrelevant? I, I personally don't think so. Mm. I, think, I think we still, when we look at um, the discipline required to go through and complete a university degree yeah. and get the qualification or get that mm. micro credential. I think that'll still hold true. Mm. Uh, when I we're think an interesting events. thing to that point will be that change. So it's, we, you know, we were talking earlier about, and you gave reference to uh, relevance, being up to date, being agile, uh, being able to, uh, I suppose, uh, understand quickly what's going on in a market and therefore mm. how can we adapt the content we're delivering mm. to students. Um, when it comes to university degrees, even though you believe, for example, that they may not be irrelevant at this point in time, mm -hmm. uh, I think one thing in particular in this fast paced world, thanks to technology, uh, people, is there an expectation potentially that even for university degrees, uh, say in the medical field where it's yeah. sort of, you need to keep that there, mm -hmm. um, is there potentially an expectation that, okay, I still need to go to university, I need to do that formal qualification but I don't want it to take four, five, six years. Yeah. I want it done in two years. Yeah. Um, and then how do you adapt that content and that delivery mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, the, the, the universities are able to uh, work at the same rate as industry? It's a really good point. I guess, you know, I probably uh, agree to disagree with Luke on some of those points there around relevancy. He's not a millennial, he doesn't understand. <laughs> Um, because I do think that, you know, universities for a long time have been able to, to sit there on their hands and not have to do a lot yeah. and still had, you know, a lot of their customers come through all mm. of the time as just a given. And now that's not happening as much. People are starting to question a little bit more and even having that question mark over it. And the fact that so many people are doing those degrees mm. kind of dilutes the value a little bit yeah. um, when you look at it from an employer perspective and, and bringing people on in the workforce. And I think I think that the students and then the employees, they, yeah. they would feel that, they'd feel commoditized because yeah. particularly in, uh, say, maybe uh, you know areas of study that a lot of people pursue, yeah. they we hear all the time that, people go and study and they still come out and they can't get a job and they're overqualified. All the time, all of the yeah. time. I think that's yeah. the most important thing in this conversation is how do we make people right skilled for work? Yeah. And how do we make sure that those skills are uh, uh, you know, adaptable and, and mm. for the future as well? Mm. So uh, I think industries working with universities is going to be something we really see much more of. Yeah. Um, Particularly, you know, we saw we saw Australian universities with the pressure that was coming onto them just before COVID, mm. through the amount of Chinese students that were travelling to Australia for work yep. um, and living in Australia, and of course boosting that economy. And then what we also saw was the fact that the Chinese government was saying, "Well, hey, Australian government, why aren't our students getting any work yeah. in Australia? You know, we've got lots of the qualified doctors, we've got lots of qualified yep. accountants, and so forth, but there's no work for them after mm. they finish their degree." Mm -hmm. Um, so the Chinese government were basically saying, well, we're paying for your, you know, we're supporting your education system and your yeah, economy, yeah. but where, and and where's your support for jobs? And international pay a significant um, so much more. amount in comparison to yeah, citizens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I think this puts pressure on universities to say, well, how can we make people job ready? How are we going to help with this global workforce and mm -hmm. stay on top and stay intuitively uh, across what, um, what skills and capability are required globally so we can help? Yeah. We can help work with industry to make sure we've got people to do those. And things. what would you say, Amy, is a key takeaway for the audience um, from the perspective of someone who's wanting to enter the workforce or mm -hmm. they're trying to navigate their way through the workforce? Mm -hmm. I think it, you need to think about yourself as an individual and what's going to help you meet your objective and your outcome. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a surgeon, go to university, go to medical yeah. school and, and do that. But if that's not your path and you're looking at other things and maybe you're looking at entrepreneurship or maybe you're looking at you know, all of these different things that might sit outside of that, you have to think about, okay, wh what's going to get me there um, in the best way, the most cost effective way, the fastest way, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's really going to serve me as an individual and 
you know, think beyond, um, I guess, some of the stereotypes out there or some of yeah. the, the behaviours and patterning that we've sort of had as a society that, you know, university is the one and only way because um, there are different to options out there yourself, now. Yeah. 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 Thank you for joining me on the show, Amy and Luke, uh, and we trust that the audience enjoyed this conversation as much as we did around what the future of university looks like. Please do make sure that you subscribe to the Reboot Show YouTube channel and we look forward to seeing you on the next segment.